Wide open space is at a premium these days in Grand Prairie, Texas. So when a teenage sweetheart is murdered in cold blood, news travels faster than a duck on a June bug, especially among the sock hop set. Did you hear that about Adrian? I wonder what she was doing out there so late at night. With an extracurricular killer on the loose, cops line up all the usual suspects to try to solve this high school whodunit. For Bob Elridge, a tall hat and a good pair of boots is not just a fashion statement. I'm probably the last cattleman in the city of Grand Prairie. And like any self-respecting Texan, Bob's workday starts at dawn when he heads into the fields to check on his bovine babies. But this morning, something's got these ladies spooked. I got up one morning and went out and got in my pickup with my dog and drove up to the front gate. And I looked out there and something just didn't look right. Just on the other side of the barbed wire fence, the body of a woman lies motionless in the grass. After checking to make sure she is beyond help, Bob hightails it back to the house to call for help. I called 911. I said, I will stay in the house until law enforcement arrives. Detective Alan Frizzell is on the early shift and immediately responds to the call out by Joe Pool Lake. As I arrived at the scene, I saw a white female laying on her back about 10 feet on the other side of the fence. She appeared to be young, had trauma to the head where blood was visible. As I got closer, I could tell at that point that she'd either been hit in the head or shot. But how she got there is a mystery. We noticed that she didn't have any identification, so basically she was unknown to us. The clues at the scene start to tell a story without a happy ending. I did notice that one of her socks was intertwined in the barbed wire as if she had tried to run through the fence to get away from her attacker. So we knew that we had a homicide on our hands. Come Monday morning, news of the murder has Grand Prairie residents all a tizzy over the unidentified lady by the lake. I don't understand what anybody would be doing up there in the middle of the night anyway. So if you're up there, you're obviously up to no good. Oh, I heard it was Lover's Lane. You know, kind of a druggy hangout, too. Sadly, the young woman at the point didn't make out so well, and Detective Alan Patton is determined to find out why. A crime scene will talk to you if you just listen to it. But this crime scene is keeping quiet about one small detail, the identity of the victim. She was taken to the morgue as a Jane Doe. Across town, another mystery is brewing. 16-year-old Adrian Jones hasn't shown up at school, and her mother is worried sick. Close friends like Mickey Red Eagle cut their busy days short to help with the search. She knows Adrian's disappearing act is far from typical. She was very responsible. She's not someone that would skip school. The final school bell rings, and sweet sophomore Adrian Jones is still AWOL. When news of the missing teen reaches Detective Patton, he does some uneasy math. The Mansfield police took a picture of Adrian to the Tarrant County Medical Examiner's Office and were able to verify that the body discovered in Grand Prairie was the body of Adrian Jones. The Jones' worst fears came true. The news of Adrian's death sweeps across the town like a Texas tornado. <laughs> And for these high schoolers, gossip sure beats homework. Oh my God, did you hear that about Adrian? I wonder what she was doing out there so late at night. Maybe she was going for a jog. Yeah, that's probably what she told her parents. Do you think she had a stalker? Yeah, that or that crazy boyfriend she had. Thanks to gossip girls like these, rumors circulate that Adrian may have known her killer. Could this all-American girl have had a wild side that put her life in danger? Adrian was on the track team, well-respected, intelligent young lady that had a lot going for her. She didn't stick with one click. She was one of those girls who would talk to anybody. A wonderful quality indeed, until it gets you killed. Sergeant Alan Patton and Detective Alan Frizzell use crime scene photos to recreate Adrian's last terrifying moments. She's still wearing her jewelry, so it doesn't appear that she was robbed. It looks like she stumbled over the barbed wire after being, you know, struck on the head. 
and she was alive when she fell to her back here. Yeah, because that's what caused her to grab the grass. Bullets recovered in the ground beneath Adrian's body tell the end of this chilling story. Whoever shot her just basically stood right above her and fired straight down. Forensics tell police this crime was personal, and the killer wasn't a stranger. I think whoever did this came back with a pistol to finish her off. Exactly. To make sure that she wasn't alive to tell anybody else about this. But who would want to see this 16-year-old cut down in the flower of her youth? Because of how she was killed, point blank, execution style, the Jones did wonder, oh my gosh, I mean, it couldn't be kids. Well, you know, kids these days. Well, we felt certain that whoever killed Adrian knew her, so there was some concern amongst the other high school kids that they might be targeted as well. Has murder replaced the three R's at Hater High? At Peters Brothers Hat Company, Joe Peters will custom fit you with a perfect Western for any occasion. And when the topic turns to murder, He's got a few theories of his own to try on for size. If I was the police, the first place I'd go is to the high school and find out who she was dating. Maybe it was a jealousy thing. It's some kind of teenage love triangle. You know, these young people and their passions. Detective Patton was once a young buck himself. He suspects that Adrian's nightmare started as a late night rendezvous. It appeared she simply walked out of the house, dressed in her clothes to go to sleep. So the appearance was that she knew who she was going to see and didn't plan on being gone long. But who was Adrian going to see? Her much older boyfriend, perhaps? Adrian was dating someone named Tracy. I don't think Linda and Bill knew a whole lot about him. Police don't either, but they're determined to find out more. Adrian's boyfriend was the first person that we wanted to talk to. Especially when little brother Scotty chimes in about his big sister's late night adventures. Adrian's brother heard her talking on the phone. And at two o'clock in the morning, he heard her alarm go off and heard what he described as squealing tires. The telltale sounds of a sneak out, which means the 19 year old bodybuilder from the wrong side of the tracks may have been the last person to see Adrian alive. And that's enough to get the muscly man of this Texan town pumped up for a solid lead. So you hear the cops uh, think they got a suspect? I've heard they think he may be that boyfriend. Well, of course, he's a big dude. I mean, he's got to be a suspect. You know, it's not, it's not always just the big dude, though. Right, and if he's so strong, why does he need a gun? Ooh, brains and brawn. Police focus their attention on Adrian's buffed up boyfriend. You know, we knew that they had been on the phone together. And maybe they had it out, way past lights out. Maybe it was her that started fighting with him, and he just fought back. And if he's a big weightlifter guy, maybe he didn't mean to kill her. That theory seems on the money. But Tracy claims he and Adrian were all talk that fateful night. Tracy said that he was home with his parents. We were able to verify that. But he does offer police a tantalizing bit of information. Apparently, he wasn't the only young gent to call on Adrian that evening. Tracy said when he was talking to Adrian that she had told him about a conversation she had had with another boy from school. Boy number two is named Brian McMillan, and he isn't quite prom king material. He was depressed and was having some emotional issues and had, as a friend, asked her to meet with him because he was so despondent. Ever trusting, Adrian makes a critical decision. She told Tracy that she had agreed to meet with him. Hours later, Adrian was found dead. And that's all it takes to condemn Brian in the court of teenage opinion. Yeah, he would always call her. He was so obsessed with her, and she wouldn't give him the time of day. Maybe he got sick of it. Yeah, and went crazy. Yeah. It is always the loners. <laughs> Thank God we're so popular. Yeah. <laughs> These hotties aren't the only ones counting their blessings. Police decide to drop in on the high school dropout turned suspect number one. The detectives found this young man and did question him. Surely Brian can provide a solid alibi to get himself off the hook. He made inconsistent statements and refused to take a polygraph. What's the matter, Brian? Got something to hide? Plenty of people in Grand Prairie think so. Most people thought that, you know, he was the one. But why would Brian McMillan kill his classroom crush? 
perhaps there just wasn't enough of Adrian to go around. They say in Texas, if you don't like the weather, just wait a few minutes. Well, high school dropout Brian McMillan certainly knows which way the wind is blowing. There were some suspicions based upon some inconsistent statements that may have been made by this young man. And Grand Prairie residents are thrilled to hear that their nightmare may soon be coming to an end. There was a big sigh of relief until I talked to Linda and realized that she didn't feel like this was the right person. Police still lack the physical evidence to tie Brian to the crime. Very early on, the medical examiner's office identified the murder weapon as a Makarov 9mm, and that's a very unusual brand. In other words, find that gun, find Adrian's killer. Clearly, you want to find the murder weapon, uh, you want to find fingerprints. But a search of Brian's car and house turns up nothing. We had absolutely no evidence to tie him to this crime. Looks like young Brian is off the hot seat, and Grand Prairie cops are back on it. It was kind of like square one, and, and everybody was kind of like, oh my gosh, now, now where do we look? So that left us basically with an unsolved homicide. News of Brian's release spices up more than one backyard barbecue. Did you hear about that Brian guy, that creep, that how they let him go? Why? So that doesn't make sense. I mean, he was so obsessed with her. I don't know. I guess they didn't have any evidence on him or something. But the kids in the know wonder if it was Adrian that had something to hide. Well, I heard she used to sneak out all the time. I don't know. I mean, everybody sneaks out, but I wonder if she met up with some out-of-towners. That doesn't really sound like her. You know, she's kind of a good girl. Even good girls have their secrets, though. The investigation goes cold for months and the town takes no comfort in knowing that there is a murder among them. Kind of scary to think that there's a killer on the loose. Yeah, you better go lock your doors tonight. Oh, boys, never fear. Nearly a year after Adrian's murder, Detective Patton receives a shocking new lead from a thousand miles away. Investigations, Patton. Later this summer, we got a call from the Naval Academy that some Academy cadets had been having girl talk in their room. But this was not just a game of truth or dare, naval edition. And they got to talking about things in their conscience that they had done in their life that they hadn't, secrets they haven't told. And one midshipwoman, Diana Zamora, has a story that tops them all. Diane had told a number of those cadets about how her boyfriend had shot and killed this young lady in Texas. Well, that's hardly a page out of the Navy Code of Conduct. Could she be speaking about Grand Perry's unsolved murder? When she made her confessions to her Academy cadets, most of them knew her boyfriend who was David Graham, an Air Force Academy cadet. And the name of that young airman rings a bell with investigators. David Graham had been a Mansfield High School student. And so was Adrian Jones. Detectives had talked to David Graham uh, during the investigation. Had investigators routinely stumbled upon Adrian's killer nearly a year ago? David was no more a person of interest than any other member of the track team until, of course, Diane added him to the mix. And very quickly, two plus two started to add up to four. Thank you. Or does it? After all, David, a straight-A student, seems a most unlikely suspect. He was a good student. Um, he was in the ROTC, but he was very arrogant. Adrian knew him through um, track and field, and they were friends. But Adrian and David might have been more than just running partners. Adrian had a conversation with David the night before on the phone. And a rumored fling one night after a track meet. Was that enough for David to shut Adrian up for good? It started making sense that this is what really could have happened. The circumstantial evidence is certainly piling up against model student David Graham. But could this hometown hero really be capable of murder? When the gossip gets back to Grand Prairie, cold beer isn't the only thing on the lips of every cowboy in town. Do the cops have a break in that case, ma'am? A couple kids from around here, straight A, clean cut, they were in ROTC. Remember them? Oh, yeah, they were in the paper. They were supposed to be the town's greatest couple and all that. Yeah, they seem like good kids to me. I don't understand it, man. That's crazy. 
but even the local intelligentsia isn't convinced that David would kill for love. They would just been making stuff up, summer party, telling stories, trying to one-up each other. Yeah, I've told a couple of tall tales in my time. Yeah. But in case Diane's not lying, cops are flying. Detectives went out to the Naval Academy to interview Diane Zamora. Where Diane's classmates obviously value honor more than friendship. The cadets made statements concerning the content of their conversations they overheard with Diane. Very quickly, investigators believed that they were on the right trail. The investigation of Adrian's murder is full steam ahead, and Detective Patton thinks Diane's slumber party story left out one crucial participant. There were basic details that she had given them that matched up to our crime scene. It was clear that Diane Zamora was a suspect in this homicide. It seems this former honor roll student may have been willing to give her boyfriend David her hand in marriage and murder. But why would two of the best and brightest cadets get mixed up in a high school murder? A cryptic confession about a hometown homicide has implicated two new suspects in the murder of Adrian Jones, 19-year-old Diane Zamora and her boyfriend David Graham. She was a pretty girl. Could have been a love triangle, you know? I don't know if I was talking to a girl like that. My girlfriend would be awful upset. In Annapolis, investigators scrutinized the story Diane Zamora spun for her fellow plebes. Now, Diane initially denied she had said any of those things, but then she said that she had just made it up trying to impress everybody. Not the best way to win friends and influence police. The wannabe sailor is in some very deep water. After the investigators left Annapolis, the Naval Academy authorities sent her home on a leave of absence pending the criminal investigation. Time may be running out for Diane, so instead of going home, she heads west for one last fling. Diane landed at DFW and then took a plane out to Colorado Springs to see David. How very sweet. She went out there to basically express her love for him and kind of gave him a heads up on what had happened so far. Oh, how very clever. But it isn't long before David has a couple more surprise visitors. Detectives went out to Colorado Springs to the Air Force Academy uh, to visit with David. Investigators have a simple plan to bring this future flyboy down to Earth. Well, then the Air Force Special Investigator asked him to take a polygraph. Quickly, the straight-A student gets his first failing grade. After he failed the polygraph, the investigators continued to talk to him. As David cracks, he reveals the dark heart of a killer. And the town of Grand Prairie braces itself for the truth about Hater High's most infamous love triangle. David's version of events was that he and Adrian had a one-time sexual relationship in his car. And hell hath no fury like a Texan girlfriend scorned. David claims that his beloved Diane was the real mastermind behind Adrian's murder. Diane had basically gone off the deep end, so to speak, and demanded him to take the life of that person who had taken her place, even for that brief moment. Incredibly, David agrees to the murderous plan to eliminate Diane's competition for his heart. It starts with a phone call from David, luring Adrian out of her house for a midnight drive. The plan was to take Adrian out by Joe Pool Lake, and he was going to break her neck, and they were going to sink her body in Joe Pool Lake. But the plan is carried out with less than military precision. As David and Adrian struggle, Diane emerges from her hiding place in the back seat. Diane had picked up a weight from the full board in the back seat and had struck Adrian in the back of the head. Stunned and bleeding, Adrian manages to escape the car and stumbles into a nearby field. He couldn't leave alive the one person who could ruin basically the rest of his life. Minutes later, Grand Prairie's star student reveals his true nature. He went over there with his Makarov pistol, which he had under his the floorboard, and he had shot her once with that pistol. But his demented lover demands he finish the job. He went back and shot her a second time. The cold-hearted kids flee the scene, cleaning themselves up just in time for school. And when police search their homes, they find all the evidence they need to charge the two young killers with murder. Detectives did recover the Makarov 9mm 
and the barbells from his father's house. And of course, the ballistics on that weapon proved it was the murder weapon. Locals are shocked to hear the sordid details of David and Diane's evil plot to kill Adrian Jones. Hard to believe a couple of cadets would do something so despicable. Guess they missed the class on honor. That's disgusting. They could have stopped it any time. Those two kids, they deserve whatever they get. In their separate trials, David and Diane's written confessions give juries all they need to do their job. Diane and David are both convicted of capital murder. The cadet killers are sentenced to life in prison. If Diane and David do make parole in 2036, they will be 58, 59 years old. A little too late for the senior prom. In the meantime, the good folks of Grand Prairie, Texas, can finally take a deep swig of relief. Well, it's all over, man, but well, that's a sad story. Sure is sadder than any country song I ever heard. Absolutely. Sadder still, the loss of that innocent refrain that kids will be kids. Because they grow up fast these days in Grand Prairie, Texas, if they grow up at all.